This week on How I Got My Start in Finance, we have Wei Zhan Shan. The notable investor chats with Brian Price about his humble beginnings and how he persevered in the face of momentous challenges. Hear him describe his harsh upbringing and ultimate success. I didn't choose my life. It was chosen for me, especially growing up in China during that period of time. You know, I wrote this book. It's a recount of history, the most horrible part of Chinese history that I lived through. And my story is rather unique, but also very representative of my generation. And at that time, there was not much choice. You just did whatever you were told to do or you were assigned to do. And I was sent to the Gobi Desert. It was not until the end of the so-called Cultural Revolution in 1976 when everything came to an end. China, in 1979, opened up established relationship, diplomatic relationship with America under Jimmy Carter. And the next year, I had an opportunity to come to America to study. That's how it happened. After that, I had some choices. Had choices which school to go, had choices what to study. And it was in this country I find choices. You oversee $30 billion. You're one of the world's most respected investors out That's of Asia. Dwarfed by American private equity firms like Blackstone. Fair enough. And they are one of your backers. Yes. Along with several U.S. pension funds. We're grateful to them for their trust. So I want to take a step back and talk about how you got to where you are, success or not. Because I want folks to understand that when I say the Gobi Desert and your book, Out of the Gobi, discusses in large part leaving Mao's China to have to do hard labor in the desert. Talk to me about that hard labor. What was that? What was that like? How did that shape you to become the man you are today? School came to the end for me when I was 12, when I finished elementary school. The country was in chaos. Schools were shut for about 10 years. And when I was 15, I, together with my friends, classmates, were sent to the Gobi Desert. And we had to do very hard labor. We were told to grow crops in the desert. And you can imagine how hard that is. And not surprisingly, we were not too successful talking about success. We had to build huts, shelters for ourselves, because there was no place to live. I made bricks. That was a back-breaking job. We had to work 16, sometimes 18 hours a day, back-breaking. And some people became sick and permanently disabled. It was very cold in wintertime, something like minus 10 in wintertime. The bad part is that that's the temperature inside and out. There's no heating. There's no fuel. The only fuel available was dried cow dung, cow manure, which we collected and burned for 10, 15 minutes before we got into bed, and if you can call it a bed, every night. That was the only source of heating, and otherwise, minus 10 inside and out. If there's a blizzard to go out to the outhouse, it was life-threatening. It was a big risk that you would have to take. And don't ask me how we coped with that. So when I first came to this country, I hear people talk about uh, there's the expression, if they don't agree with each other, they say bullshit. And I would think to myself, that thing used to be very dear to me. And that was the only source of heating that we had. So to this day, I like to sit by a fireplace because we experienced so much cold. And that life didn't come to an end until about six years later. And of course, the worst thing during that period of time was starvation. There was never enough to, to eat. If you look at me, I you know, probably look uh, emaciated uh, to you. <laughs> and that was the starvation from that time. And then you were able to teach yourself math by candlelight. 
if I'm not mistaken. I did, in an unsystematic way. I just read whatever books I could lay my hands on. And there was no school, as I mentioned, for 10 years. So very few people bothered to read, to study. And in fact, all the books were banned. Reading was frowned upon. I got into trouble by doing it. But at the end of it, I was somewhat educated because I didn't give up. And eventually I was able to obtain a formal education, including a PhD from UC Berkeley. So when I look at the kids today, especially in this country, I think they're so privileged. You know, they have the education. Unfortunately, many people take that for granted. We couldn't. It was a privilege that we didn't have. But studying, reading, got me where I am today. Had I given up, like most of my peers at that time, I would not have had a job at this particular point, as most of my friends have long lost their jobs. When China opened up, they didn't have any skills to obtain any decent jobs, because for 10 years, there was no education. So education, to me, is the most important thing. It gets to where you need to be, or where you want to be, especially in this country. So teaching yourself math, teaching yourself English, to then getting your education in the U.S. and eventually becoming a professor at Warden. In your wildest dreams, did you ever think that such things could be possible? And do you think outside of America that type of dream is possible? Or is it something that only in America that could happen? At that time, I didn't have any dreams because we were told to take root in the Gobi Desert. So I was prepared to spend the rest of my life in that place. But I also told myself, I have to prepare myself. My philosophy in life is to be always prepared. I believe that sometimes you just don't have opportunity to get anywhere. But when the opportunity comes, if you're not prepared to grasp it, it's your fault. If opportunity never comes your way, then it's not your fault. So America is where, as long as you want to get to some place, I think the opportunities are more or less equal. It's not completely equal, to be honest, but it's more or less equal. We came to this country without money, without money to pay for tuition. A professor donated money to cover my tuition. And eventually, many kind people helped me to get a formal education. So I'm very fortunate to benefit from the generosity of ordinary people in this country and from America itself. Now, China has opened up, so there's more equal opportunities for ordinary people to get to some place. But that was not the case 40 years ago when China was still very much closed under a different system. From teaching himself math in a work camp in the Gobi Desert, to earning his PhD, and to running his own fund, Sean is a shining example of taking advantage of opportunity to better one's lot in life. For Real Vision, I'm Justine Underhill.